state of West Virginia issued EI DuPont Company a permit for them to run their contaminated wastewater down through two farms here out into this stream of water. This is a 151 of these animals that's died on this farm up here since this stuff's been coming down through this water. But they won't try to keep everything hushed up. Like it's some kind of big secret of some kind that they're dumping it in here. They won't tell us what it is. They don't want to talk to me because I'm just an old dumb farmer. I'm not supposed to know anything. But it's not going to be covered up because I'm going to bring it out in the open for people to see. American production has become the most efficient in the world. And as a result, our factories and industrial plants are turning out an ever-increasing amount of goods, things that people want and need. DuPont research chemists developed a new and unique white substance. The result is the greatest advance in cookware. DuPont Teflon. Here are two different types of fry pan. This non-stick finish for cookware never needs scouring. All kinds of burned food come off quickly and easily. Corn muffins don't stick to Teflon. Fudge cakes don't stick to Teflon. Even sticky buns don't stick to Teflon. Almost nothing sticks to it. DuPont Teflon saves me lots of dirty work. It's so easy to clean. The seal means DuPont has approved the finish, that it's no stick and easy to clean. So look for the Teflon 2 quality seal. Look for this seal. Look for the seal. Look for this sticker. Well, it, it sounds great, but uh, is it really safe to cook in? I was working, and I had made an arrangement for you guys to get your picture taken. This one, I, this one right here? Mm-hmm. I always tell her this picture. It just, <laughs> I, I just look at this, and it just. It says, William Bailey the third buck. You were six years old. You went to Jeb Stewart Middle School in kindergarten, 86 yeah. and 87. I just, I don't know. It's, I feel so bad for that kid. <laughs> yeah, not because of anything you, just because the times were hard. I knew you guys were working as hard as you could. And I'm wearing a velvet green shirt, you know? Uh, I just remember it was my first year of school that I actually went to school with kids. And I stood out. Yep. Yeah. That was when you were first born. How long do they wait to take pictures? I'm sure they wanted to get that one taken right away because... There was a chance that I might not make it. That's what they said. When Becky was born, I went into shock. He was born with half of a nose, one nostril, a serrated eyelid, and a keyhole pupil where the iris and the retina is not connected. You could tell he was in distress because he couldn't breathe really well. I was scared to death to hold that baby. I was scared he's gonna die in my arms. Your dad didn't stay with me that night. I didn't want him to. We just, each one of us wanted to be just alone with our thoughts, you know. And he, you know, he didn't want to go with you or stay with me. When I was pregnant with Bucky, I worked for DuPont around Teflon. 
they tried to blame me. They said it was something that I did. And the more they would tell me that, the more suspicious I got. But I didn't know what I'd been exposed to. And the first day that I went back to work, someone in our locker room said a girl that worked there had a baby that had deformities. We got to talking about it. It was just like Bucky. She worked around Teflon too. May the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away. Build traditional one. Now, I like that song my dad used to sing to my mom. She'd get about a half teat off at him. Get that little beard. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. He can make her cry. I'm from Parkersburg, West Virginia. Been here all my life. I ended up getting married and having children and settling down in this area. I started with DuPont in 1962 and uh, was there almost 40 years in Teflon land. First time I heard that Teflon might be uh, dangerous, I was told by a supervisor, we fear that it might be detrimental to the women who are pregnant. So we sent all the women home, but it won't hurt the men. That's the first time I, well, I, I, and I questioned him. I said, don't hurt the men? He said, oh, no, can't I? You don't know, worry about it, as far as we know. Uh, can I have another bottle of that uh, B12? It's, it's one of those. Yeah, we have the 50. Hey, this is the, you, you didn't have colostrum, do you? You didn't have we, that, do you? Yeah, we do. That's the thing that, when I was going through the cancer real bad, mm -hmm. I started taking colostrum. And uh, it, it helped me get through all the surgeries and, uh, and all the, you know, a lot my, of people... I couldn't hardly get out of the chair. I was so weak. Well, when they removed the women from Teflon, it was a big shock to me. They just don't do that. I knew right then it was a big cover-up. And see, all that time when I was pregnant, I was in direct contact with the chemicals. I did tell them. I told them right to their face. I said, I know you're responsible for it, and you've lied, and they, they're still lying. But I knew I couldn't quit because I needed the insurance. Bucky needed help right then. The first surgery I had, they, they had on my eye from the time I was a few months old to five years old. I probably had about 30 surgeries. Initially, I accepted it, and I just thought I was dealt a bad hand. I mean, I cared about what I looked like, obviously. I looked in the mirror every single day, so there were things that I, I cared about my appearance. But my parents were pretty... They wanted me to be cool with who I was. I'll back off of you a little bit. And uh, here's a handsome looking guy. <laughs> be 13, 
January the 15th, 13 years old. I remember walking into seventh grade for the first day of school and every person just looking at me. It's like, this is awesome. This is, this is great, you know? <laughs> And then going through the next phase of that surgery where I had a balloon implanted into my forehead and they would fill that up with saline to stress the skin, which they would bring down and, you know, use for my nose. There's no pain that I've ever gone through that was greater than that. I mean, migraine times a thousand. To go home and to have that pain and for my dad to walk in and say, hey, get up, put your hat on, we're going out. And I'm like, I'm not going out, Dad. I just got bad out of the hospital. You know, I'm not leaving. Look at my, look at me, Dad. He's like, you look fine. He's like, look, we're gonna go out. He's like, you you know those shoes you wanted, those those Airwalks you wanted. He's like, let's go, let's go pick out a pair. And you know, just just thinking about how he never gave up. You know, he, he always pushed me. Easy. Easy. He, he never wanted me to sulk. I'm cool! He never wanted me to be down on who I was, and my mom was the same way. They never, they never let me just be affected by it. They were always leading me through it. You know, it really didn't bug me too much growing up as a kid. I was just, you know, worried about, you know, making it through the next day of school. But it was kind of coming to a point when I was 18, 19, I stopped thinking about how I'd been dealt a bad hand and that was just my lot in life. Just thinking about, I need an answer. You know, I need to know what's going on. I need to know why this happened. I want you to notice his height. I want you to notice what his eyes look like. They're born that way. Now, I never saw nothing like this in my life. And very unusual. Wilbur Tennant was a farmer who sold part of his land to DuPont. The piece that DuPont had was adjacent to his property that he continued to own. In their negotiations around this, they said that they were going to use his land for non-hazardous waste. But very quickly, he noticed changes in the water. This is what I'm talking about. We haven't had any rain now for several days. This sud has been here for a while. And he noticed that little things, little fish began to die, and he began to find dead animals. I've taken dead deer and dead cattle off of this ripple right here. And every veterinarian that I've called in Parkersburg, they will not return my phone calls or they don't want to get involved. Actually, go ahead. I'm, I'm not going to do this right now. Just give me the document. Okay. We're now on the record, and our time is 9.01 a.m. Our opponent today is Bernard J. Riley. Our court reporter is Michelle Gray. We'll now swear in the witness. You have your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this matter. We will hold true. Nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. Well, let's look at LP2. Yeah, this it's, is to Tom Adams. Who's Tom Adams? He's an old friend I met in the Army. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's go ahead and read. The shit is about to hit the fan in West Virginia. Go ahead. Why don't you read it? Because you wrote sure. it. Sure. The shit is about to hit the fan in West Virginia. WV. 
The lawyer for the farmer finally realizes the surfactant issue. He is threatening to go to the press to embarrass us to pressure for big bucks. Want me to read the bad, read the bad word yeah, there? Yeah, it says fuck him. That's what it says. I apologize to anybody that's sensitive about bad words. Well, you wrote it. I was writing to an old army friend. So right. You're Every one. case, in a complex oh, case, there's several parts to it. One part is the workup. That means finding the documents. It means trying to take some basic depositions to find out who did what, why did they do certain things, how did they do certain things. That's called the discovery process. The documents in this case, they really tell the story about what the company knew. Isn't it a good thing, though, that the company kept this? Because we can go back and look at history now. It, it is a good thing that they kept these, these documents, isn't it? You're saying it's a good thing. I can, Mr. Papatoni, you can fra frame that any way you want. The backstory of this case is, is, is interesting. It started with a lawyer named Rob Balot. He's a corporate defense lawyer by trade. And so this corporate defense lawyer gets this case and he starts looking at it. When we got into the litigation with DuPont, we got access to a lot of the internal documents and we found out that DuPont and another company called 3M had been studying this chemical dating back to the 1950s and 1960s. Dr. Carrier being handed what's been marked as Exhibit 30. I ask you to take a look at that and tell me if you can identify this document. Yes, I can. And it's entitled Ammonium Perfluoroactanoate, parentheses, FC143, parentheses, C8 compound. The heart of the case is this plant in West Virginia, they make Teflon. They make Teflon that is used for all types of sources. C8 is one of the elements they need to make Teflon. PFOS, PFOA, C8, these are all names for this group of miracle chemicals that came out of primarily 3M initially and out of DuPont. I started at DuPont in 1981. Most of my career was spent in the new product development end. Teflon is a very generic term. The active ingredient in it is fluorine. You hear the word F in that, right? PFOA, PFOS, anything with the F in it is something you want to be very wary of. These chemicals have these wondrous properties. Non-stick, oil repellent, water repellent. How do you recall C8 first coming to your attention? The first recollection I have of it is when the supplier of the chemical, the 3M company, provided DuPont with some information about rats that had been subjected to exposure to the chemical. 3M had some test data indicating potential birth defects here in the eyes of rat fetuses following exposure to C8, correct? That's correct. So you, you did see there was a substantial risk to the women at the DuPont plant who were exposed to C8, enough to remove them from further exposure, correct? No. There was no, no, no. There was no potential risk to the women. Based upon the 3M study, there was a potential risk to the fetus. Flight to Parkersburg WV, another long meeting to describe to the plant folks where the guy who was suing us over his cattle grazing downstream of our landfill would crucify us before a jury. Most simply do not believe how big and bad we would look and how sympathetic the farmer would look before a jury, even though he is a con man. You call him Mr. Tennant a con man? Uh, this is a letter to my son, I can tell you. But are you calling him a con man? To his face. And when you called him a con man, did you know how many of his cattle had died? The short answer is, I did not know how many of his cattle had died. Within a couple of years, his entire herd died. For Tennant, it was his livelihood. Advantages of settling. Do you see that? Yes. It says C8 in the stream. We never told them, right? See that? 
That's what it says. When did you first become involved with APFO or C8? I was first aware of it prior to 1977, knowing that uh, perfluorinated materials had been found in, in human blood. At first, 3M and DuPont were checking to see the contamination levels of their workers. And so naturally, they needed a control. They needed to compare those workers' blood levels of C8 with the population so they could see what the difference was. So they started going to archived blood supplies and checking to see what clean blood versus the blood of their workers might look like. There was no clean blood. They tested kids, they tested adults, they went to Asia, they went all over the world, and everywhere they looked, practically, they found their chemicals in people's blood. Eventually, they did find some clean blood. It turned out it was the blood that had been taken from army recruits and archived, saved, at the start of the Korean War. That blood was clean because the Teflon chemicals weren't out into the environment at that point. The main sources of exposure are still something of a mystery. The likely culprits, though, are industrial waste and the consumer products that shed this material over time. Today, every baby, probably on the planet, but certainly in the developed world, where all of these chemicals are widely used, every baby is born with at least some level of C8, of uh, PFOS uh, and PFOA in their, in their blood. That's the, the, the essence of exposure, lifelong exposure. And it's involuntary. No one said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm good with a little Teflon chemical in my baby's blood. No one said that. They said, I love these pans. We think of these chemicals as associated with 3M and DuPont, but they also had sold them to other companies that manufactured consumer products, manufacturing products. It was used in airplanes and cars. On and on, the applications were endless. Workers are now using Teflon to rust-proof the inside of the Statue of Liberty. I found that these chemicals could bond paper products to make food wraps, grease-proof wraps, cookie bags. One of the largest companies had patents for making popcorn bags. Thousands of facilities, including the furniture store down the street that sprayed a nonstick chemical on your couch to keep stains off. All of those places became environmental contamination sites. And today, a product that you'll find Teflon is in clothing and things. Gore-Tex is the brand name. These are apparently are And then you realize that companies in Asia and in Europe were starting to make these chemicals as well. Teflon PTFE beschichtung aus. This crisis had been growing for decades. I think with a chemical that potentially uh, it's bio-persistent, you pay particularly uh, close attention to it. Bioaccumulation, bio-persistence, those are fancy words for it. What do you mean by bio-persistent? When you die and they bury you, you're going to have it in your blood. C8 seemed to have a long half-life in humans. Sunlight doesn't break them down. Microbes don't break them down. Heat doesn't break them down. Nothing breaks them down. They called this fluorine chemical the devil's piss. It was so potent. Once it gets into your system, it remains in your blood. My gut tells me the bioperistence issue will kill us 
because of an overwhelming public attitude that anything that is biopersistent is harmful. And so naturally, these Teflon and Scotchgard chemicals permeated the living world. We didn't know it at the time, but the evidence showed that 3M and DuPont, they knew all about it. lovely bunch of coconuts. Okay. Stay on the gym floor, the boundary of the gym floor. You ready? Go! Oh, no. Wang, you gotcha. <laughs> Ouch! What'd you do, boy? Bye, bye, bye. Good job, good job. <laughs> Yahoo! Thank you. Good job. I love kids. Of course, I'm a school teacher, you know. And that's the thing that drove me more than anything. You know, I don't consider myself a whistleblower, more or less a fact finder. Joe has a courtyard out back. He calls it his man cave. And we were out there just talking on a normal day. I know when it was, it was October. I'd gone to the mailbox that afternoon, and I saw this envelope. And it was from Lubeck Public Water Department. I opened it, and there was a letter in with my water bill stating that DuPont needed to notify us there was a chemical in our water. They called it C8. I thought, well, what's this about? I read it. I, I really didn't give it much thought. DuPont says, according to their standards, it's healthy. Hey, OK. DuPont says it's safe, it's safe. Why question this? Well, I was testing CH as soon as I started in the lab, more or less. From the get-go, they always picked on me for new jobs. <laughs> they always give them to me because they knew I'd do it. I'd learn it. Where I was at, I was isolated. I mean, it was a big room with huge cylinders that were full of C8, and they would bubble over. So you can think of it like a bubble bath out of control. That's the best way of describing it. After they made the Teflon, it had water that was discharged from it. My job was to pump it out back so it would go directly to the river. As C8 was being used at that DuPont plant, 3M told DuPont that under no circumstances should you put it in waterways. It's right there in the document. Don't put this in the waterways. But at the end of the day, they start dumping so much C8 into the water that they, at one point, lose track of how much they've actually put out there. DuPont wanted to figure out how far it had seeped beyond its plant. So a team of folks went out with some jugs, plastic jars, and went to general stores and went miles down river to collect samples. They found that, in fact, the chemical had gone quite far from the plant. Their own scientists again and again, their own lawyers, in fact, told them, you know, we really should tell people about this because they're drinking it. They're bathing in it. Who makes the final decision as to whether or not there is a risk that needs to be disclosed to the community? Well, again, risk is relative. The 
when we got the letter, within the next few weeks, a friend of ours talked about her granddaughter's teeth turning black and they couldn't understand it. Then looked over and there's my neighbor's dog's tumors all over him. He couldn't explain. He said, I've never seen the like. Every time I see somebody get sick, it wasn't just a cold or a flu. And then I heard about you know, these young guys, two of them, having testicular cancer in the area. It got to the point where something just, I, I did, something just didn't feel right. And for some reason, don't ask me why or what, but that letter kept hanging in the back of my head. I couldn't get it out of my head. What's that doing in our water anyway? I thought, well, shoot, I'll just call Department of Natural Resources. I'll ask him what it is. Didn't know anything about it. Well, that's not my field. I thought, well, boy, that's a strange attitude. I got a hold of the clean water people. I went to the wellhead people, Department of Health, and God, I mean, I got shut off on them. I told Darlene, I said, honey, something's not right here. So I called DuPont, talked to the head toxicologist for 45 minutes. I hung the phone up, and Darlene said, well, what'd you find out? I said, I was just fed the biggest line of BS I think I've ever been fed. We heard that very early in the production of Teflon products, there was a manufacturer up in the Midwest who called and said, we want you to come over here and look at this. We are heating up this Teflon, and we heard this pounding noise on the roof. It sounded like a hailstorm. It was a flock of birds. As they were flying over where the vent was, they just dropped out of the sky. By 1984, the company knew that the material was going into the Ohio River, it's going up into the air, and we're telling the community about it. The particles in the air that came up into our old lab, we always wondered what it was. It wasn't dust. It was a white kind of material. It's all over the plant, in the air. I think that's how it happened. When they cut me for the cancer, they took all of my rectum, part of my colon. Your whole life, your whole life's completely different, you know. You don't sit on a toilet ever again. I, I change this thing three or four times a day, sometimes five. So this is everyday life for me. They told me two months to live, and I'm lucky to be here telling the story. That's why you called and requested that I go ahead and schedule a deposition so you'd have a chance to testify while you were still alive. And before I die, I want to get this out. When you were down there in the uh, Teflon lab, um, did you work with a lot of other people that have been sick or died early? One of my good friends, Carol Kaplinger, he had leukemia of the blood. He died. How old was he? He's only 50, 40, something 50. Anybody else? Uh, Jim Broadwater. The last time I seen him, they, they were taking him to the Cleveland Clinic, and he died up there. How old was he? 50. Pat Ancrum, she worked B-shift, and she passed away. Joy Weaver, they had him on chemo. I knew him all my Teflon days. Don Lutz, Lana Frankhouse, Daryl Cronin. Secretary. How old was he? 30s. And I lost a good friend. He was, he loved baseball. He used Cliff Spiker, Steve Bailey, Alona Carr, she passed away. Paul Radaball's gone. Glenn Pepper's gone. Cliff Smith's gone. Jim Huey, he had a tumor show up. A month later, he died. Is there any doubt in your mind that all of these people were exposed to C8 based upon your personal observation? Exactly. To the best of my ability, I say they were all. Well, 
Why is pressure? And to see somebody you'd work with every day, my friends, die, that's hard. That was, a, that was, a, that was devastating. a handkerchief for a sweaty fat guy. <laughs> it's one thing that uh, I've never had to buy our handkerchiefs, because my dad was a, a pastor, so he took them all the time. So all my handkerchiefs are my dad's. Actually, the the church we go to, he started it. Yeah. He passed away in 2008, so yeah. You good? I just need to get some bottled water. Cool. I was probably about 19 when I think we met. The summer before we got married, so it was 2002. OK. So we met then. The funny thing is, we didn't like each other at all. Did not. Absolutely opposite. I, w I became Opposite friends, you know, with that people point. that knew him, and they had us meet, and I was like, no, and he was like, no, and it was kind of like... I kind of pursued after her, and it was more like hitting a brick wall. She didn't I kept really... saying no. <laughs> <laughs> he finally started leaving me alone was the thing. Oh, okay. And yeah. um, I kind of could see more of who he really was, that he really was just funny and a gentleman, and he treated people with respect, and... I, once he finally started leaving me alone, I could see that, and then I started liking him. <laughs> we were engaged like maybe, maybe two months after I started liking him. <laughs> yeah. That day was beautiful. His father was still here. We were very proud of him, both of them, Bucky and Melinda. Does everybody have the verse? Yes. Yes, OK, verse. You are good all the time. Whatever happened, you know, made him who he was, and it didn't, I guess it didn't really matter to me. And I guess later when we thought about a future family, you know, you just, all that stuff goes through your head, you know, when you're like, this is the person I'm gonna marry, and, you know, is this gonna affect our lives? And I remember it more bothering him, and him saying how he would never, I don't wanna cry, <laughs> he would never wanna have a kid have to go through all that he went through as a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want it to hinder him wanting to start a family, even though it was a concern for us in reality. Before we started trying, we wanted to see how high his C8 levels were and what was in his bloodstream. They had a special geneticist come in and, you know, it was kind of like my biggest fear, <laughs> you know, being manifest right in front of my eyes. His levels were so much higher, higher than even what his mom has in her bloodstream. They said that there was at least a 50% chance that it could be passed on to the babies, you know, that they could end up with exactly what he went through. Okay, but it says big announcement. Go ahead and read that next to the last uh, paragraph. 
Big announcement, 3M, two days ago, it is going to stop making scotch guard because it is too persistent in the environment and gets into our blood. They then told us they are going to stop making a related product that is an essential ingredient in the Teflon polymer, also is very persistent and also gets into blood, but so far, no signs it has hurt anyone. If it does, we are really in the soup because essentially everyone is exposed one way or the other. The first time we came across this issue was May of 2000, and it was just a short little story that 3M had decided to replace the chemistry that uh, was underneath Scotchgard with something else, and that this was going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars in that year. 3M was presenting to the US EPA some information that had just come in, some rat studies with PFOS and the widespread presence of the chemical being found in the blood as well. And EPA was expressing concerns about that data. And so 3M and the EPA hammered out an agreement where they would voluntarily take PFOA and PFOS off the market. At the time, the best producer of the perfluorochemicals was 3M. DuPont looked at that business, and I was there at the time, and they said, Yahoo, the king is dead. And in fact, within a few months, DuPont made a decision not only to continue using PFOA, but to actually begin manufacturing PFOA at its facility in North Carolina, correct? I, I don't recall the exactly timing or phasing, uh, but uh, you're correct. Uh, within some period of time, we concluded to manufacture the product and to continue using the product. Rob Ballot, the attorney who was working on the Tenon case at that time, came across this announcement of 3M's decision, and that, in fact, is when he made the connection. DuPont had dumped a similar chemical in the water on Tenon's property. I sent a letter to the US EPA on March 6th of 2001, summarizing what we were seeing in the internal documents, providing information to the agency to let them know we think you ought to look into PFOA and investigate it. Rob Ballot would fight DuPont to disclose documents that had anything relevant to this chemistry. As these documents came to his possession, he would send the most relevant ones directly to EPA. DuPont tried to get a gag order from a judge to stop him because they knew that he had the goods. He knew what was going on with their chemical and could nail them. Down here it says that Balot has given 130 of our worst documents that he got in discovery to EPA. You see that, 130? Yes. Now, what are the worst documents? If you were to look at the DuPont documents, how would you uh, consider them the worst not documents? I'm entirely sure I re have recollections. I assume they're the tox toxicology documents. All the way back to the 60s, they are aware, clearly aware, of the risk of the product. Their own documents show that this is a toxin. They continued to find toxicity effects through the late 1960s. By 1988, they started doing cancer studies. In that particular study, increased rate of Leydig cell tumors were found, correct? Uh, that is correct. Their studies were showing rats dying, dogs dying, monkeys dying. They were seeing testicular tumors, liver disease, pancreatic disease. Unfortunately, monkeys, even at the lowest dose, were dying after being exposed to PFOA. And they know that these primate studies have a direct relationship to what we'll find in the human population. DuPont itself had classified PFOA as a confirmed animal carcinogen 
possible human carcinogen. All of this information was clear evidence that should have been disclosed under federal law. But those documents didn't show up at EPA at all. When they began to show up as a result of this court case, that's when everything changed. When do you cross the threshold from convenient to dangerous? That's what the Environmental Protection Agency is trying to determine with a very popular chemical in almost every household. They just started digging. Finally, I talked to the National Environmental Protection Agency. And when I read the gentleman the letter, he said, I'm going to send you some information. And when I do, he said, I want you to read it very carefully, because after you read it, you'll probably want to contact a lawyer. I said, whoa, OK. Next day, I got it in the mail. I opened it. And I read the information and what it was. It was on the tenant case. You see the discoloration in that eye? They're born that way. Cow there, if you got to open her mouth and got to check on her teeth, it'll probably be all black or jaw teeth. This is what her teeth looks like. The key part of that was is when they said the cattle, their teeth had turned black. And I thought, wait a minute. They talked about the kid's teeth turning black. I started putting two and two together, and I looked up in the corner. I saw Rob Balot's name up there. So I said, I'm going to call this guy. It says, learn in the deposition that Earl Tennant uses Lubeck drinking water, and we know that Balot has requested information from the Lubeck Water Company. You see that? I see that, yes. So this letter, it had a legal purpose. According to West Virginia law, two years after this letter went out, the statute of limitations would run out. And then you go on to say the real danger is what steps the lot might take to expand the number of plaintiffs and introduce new environmental allegations into this lawsuit. And if he does, what will the court allow him to do? The public had two years to respond. If there was no response, the case was legally dead. Time to wake up tomorrow, but then more rain comes back to your forecast tomorrow. 87, your high temperature, and we'll keep that pattern throughout the rest of the week. Mid 80s and mid 60s. Rob calls me from Cincinnati Airport and he said, uh, My law firm wants to take this case on. He said, Do you want to take it on as a class action or do you want to take it on as a civil? I said, I've just got a gut feeling something's not right here. I said, Where do we get the most help for the most people? He said, class action. I said, let's do her. I said, no, absolutely not. Why? Because, because of the involvement with my ex-husband and because of the involvement of our children. My ex-husband worked at DuPont. So anything that might cause them any kind of pain or anything, I just didn't want them to be involved. But I could see it in Joe's eyes. And he said, I really think you need to do it. I said, if you want me to, I will. I'll do it for you. But we've got to be very protective and very careful. Everybody in this area, in one way or another, is connected to DuPont. You go dealing with somebody's livelihood, which is their job, which is their insurance and their protection, and you go messing with that, you're going to have problems. You can't walk into a restaurant or any gathering here in Parkersburg and not run into somebody that either worked at DuPont, 
has a relative that worked at DuPont, has a good friend that worked at DuPont. The net profit for all this, if you want to turn it to money, is better schools, better educational system. DuPont helped fortify the city of Parkersburg. DuPont is very good at locking up the town. When there is something that's not going their way, they'll help the schools, they'll talk to the churches. They're very big on the PR. They have an unbelievable reputation for safety, good jobs, great benefits, good citizens. I mean, everybody thought they could do no wrong. DuPont was my idol. I used to cut grass for DuPonters when I was young. But I don't blame them. It's the people who run the company, the people who make the decisions. I should have opened my eyes. But I love DuPont so much that I felt they wouldn't put me in harm's way. We want to believe corporate America. It's too horrible to believe that every day we get up, we're at the mercy of a corporation who might lie to us, who might poison us, who might create a product that's going to kill us for profit. There was consensus reached that the issue which will decide future action is one of corporate image and corporate liability. Liability was further defined as the incremental liability from this point on if we do nothing, as we are already liable for the past 32 years operation. See that? Yes. In 1984, they already admit we have been liable for 32 years. They had made a money decision. On the next page, looking ahead, legal and medical will most likely take a position of total elimination. They have no incentive to take any other position. See that? Yes. The product group will take a position that the business cannot afford it. We know that there was a discussion about, do we need to come up with something in our Teflon production that's not going to cause these problems? And they conclude, if we launch something new, it's going to cost us a lot of money. We have to stick with C8. C8 is the devil we know. I think they recognized that Teflon was a very significant part of the business. It all boils down to economics. Let's just ignore the situation and continue using PFOA, because nobody's going to force us to stop it. It's called externalizing cost. We want to make all the profits at DuPont, and we want to pass all the risk, all the illness, all the suffering, all the cost of cleanup onto the taxpayers. We're having spaghetti, I'm sorry. Well, I am too. It's leftover, so you know it'll be good. Everybody goes through life thinking water's safe. You go in and get it out of your sink and think, ah. To think that a, an advanced country like we live in, you wouldn't think of it being polluted or dangerous. It's, it's a sad situation. I mean, it's. It's terrible that you have to be concerned about the water you drink. The Ohio River comes down through Parkersburg and goes toward us, supplying the people in Evans with their water. Evans is approximately 40 miles from the Parkersburg DuPont plant. Parkersburg was certainly contaminated with chemicals, C8, correct? Um, I don't know if I would characterize it that way. 50,000 pounds annually put into the river is not a contamination? 
At one point, DuPont came out and said, if your drinking water is showing more than one part per billion of C8, then you better not drink the water. Let me give you an idea why that is. It's one drop of C8 in an Olympic-sized pool. Well, there's a hell of a lot more than that in people's water in the Ohio River Valley. Probably around 98 or 99, my thyroid gland was causing the problem. And high cholesterol. And I had high cholesterol. But, um, and I was having problems with my bowels. And they came up with a real bad case of uh, ulcerative colitis. You have an ulcer in your colon and it will start to bleed every so often. When it does, you better be near a bathroom. If you don't, you're going to have an embarrassing situation. He couldn't get it under control. His doctor told me, he said, it's amazing that he has not gotten cancer from it. He said, it's, it's inevitable it's going to happen from this, but. It's not going to happen now because I don't have a colon. <laughs> they took my colon, so I'm not going to have colon cancer. You know, I was always thinking that one day I can retire and enjoy life and we could travel, but not anymore. I don't talk about this situation very often. I don't tell other people about it, but... Uh... It's changed my whole life. Now a lawsuit brought by local residents accuses DuPont of trying to cover up what it knew about Teflon's risks. Joe Kiger says he had no intention of hurting the DuPont Corporation when he agreed to be part of a suit challenging the health effects of C8. It was a class action suit on behalf of, it turned out, six different water districts and tens of thousands of people. Everybody said, well, we knew it was a bunch of crap. You know, DuPont would not poison anybody. The shop talk was that Joe was out to get filthy rich. <laughs> We've had some resistance. I mean, far as being shunned, wife got a phone call one day and the, the guy gets on there and starts cussing her out. This is awful, you're doing this. There's not a thing wrong with Why that Why are you water? browbeating poor DuPont like this? And we heard, it, we heard it from people in that area. Teflon, that famous brand name known for non-stick surfaces, may pose health risk. The EPA has added... As the story began to break, DuPont scientists were working to produce public pronouncements saying, look, we've taken a look at it. It's nothing to be concerned about. Based on our assessment of the science, we do not believe this poses any cancer risk. Chemicals that have an effect in animals don't necessarily have a similar effect in humans. First of all, DuPont put together this team of legal experts and scientists to defend their chemical. And it was led by someone named Mike McCabe. Sometime during 2000, you became the US EPA deputy administrator, correct? I received a commission from the president to be the deputy administrator. Before that, I was acting administrator. And in 2003, you began working through McCabe and Associates for DuPont, correct? Correct. Mike McCabe had been the number two guy at EPA. And he got other former EPA folks with him. And they really pushed back. There was a revolving door that was taking place between DuPont and the EPA. DuPont had basically gained control of governmental decisions. The ask, you see the ask, and then ask is in quotes. In our opinion, the only voice that can cut through the negative stories is the voice of EPA. 
the governmental agencies that should have been responsible, the EPA. Those people were captured by DuPont. It's called corporate capture. They're sharing documents. They're showing each other things before they happen. The DuPont folks are requesting quotes from the EPA to put in their own press releases. Subject urgent, see that? Coverage has been broad in print and network media. Significant disruptions in our markets and our consumers are very concerned. We need EPA to quickly, like first thing tomorrow, say the following. Consumer products sold under the Teflon brand are safe. Further to date, there are no human health effects known to be caused by PFOA. DuPont did, in fact, ask EPA to make those statements, correct? That's correct. So all of a sudden, the EPA said, oh, yeah, we'll do whatever you want us to do, which is a complete scam, utter scam. And it was very successful. As for all those pots and pans in the homes of Americans, both DuPont and the federal government say there's no need right now, Elizabeth, to throw them out. No need to throw them out, but it seems like plenty of need for concern. try let's see I don't know how this will come out on him but we can try and give it a shot I will say this is something we really had to pray about to know are we gonna take the next step and have children yeah there's definitely been some struggles with it basically the bottom line was there's a 50% chance that everything is gonna be fine because his hands are right there. This is, he has his hand kind of over his face like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can't see his nose. This is his eyelid. He's just... He doesn't want to cooperate. Nope. He does not want to cooperate. Okay. I pray that our child doesn't have any type of deformities and that it's 100% healthy, but we're ready for it. I lived my whole life for this, so, you know, who, who better? Okay. So that's like a, one side of his face. Okay. So How's this right here? You got it upside down. Yeah. But she tried. Yeah. Tried to get a profile. She was like. He was Come like. On. She was like wiggling on my stomach, trying to get him to take his hands down from his face, and he wouldn't do it. He kept yeah. like going back up like this. He was scared. can't imagine him holding the baby and the baby being his and Melinda's. They've been married for 12 years. I know that they held back for so long. I just wish his father was here to see it. It's gonna be okay, really. Yeah, I know, I just... <clears throat> Um, I miss my dad. I know it. Look, 
love just to talk to him about this. In 2005, we got the call from DuPont. They say that, you know, that they want to mediate. Of course, we went through negotiations and everything for the settlement, settlement amount. Now, the implementation phase of the settlement in that case begins. As a Generally, with the settlement, people just want to be done with it. They want to get their cash. They want to walk. Because it's usually a long time coming. But what happened in the case of C8 was really radically different. Rather than just take that money provided by DuPont under the settlement and divide it up among the class members and walk away, what we decided to do was set up something we called the C8 Science Panel. The community wanted to know, does drinking PFOA actually have links to human disease? The settlement is far from the end of the C8 case. It merely sets into motion a blood test process which six different water districts are eligible to take. That was a sacrifice on the part of the people who had won the money, but it was one that could have turned out paying off for everybody in the world. You have to remember that DuPont has spread C8 all over the planet at this point. The science panel was so important to determine exactly how bad this stuff is. I said, if this stuff is harming people and they've known full well what's going on, we owe it to these people to get this thing right. According to the settlement, any of those people in these six water districts could sue if this science panel could prove whether the exposures had caused any harm. DuPont remains confident the test results will prove C8 is safe, but a lot depends on how many take the test. It's my belief that when DuPont settled this case, they had predetermined that no epidemiological study could be done large enough to ever get a link. And with no link, the jury comes back you're innocent, and you could never be tried again. The problem is when you ask people to volunteer for a study, not many people are going to show up. And so uh, who's going to do this? We want to get this thing up and running because the momentum was there. The case had been settled. So we put a lot of information out in ads and pamphlets, you name it, every, every type of media we could get our hand. We flooded the market. Healthy drinking water is vital to all of us. That's why scientists need to know if the chemical C8 causes any health problems. By completing a health questionnaire and having your blood tested, you can help. And you may be paid up to $400. To get started, call 1-800-680. We ended up also using that money to pay class members to come in and have their blood tested for PFOA and to provide access to their medical information. This daughter of a DuPont worker is ready to cash her $400 check. That's not too shabby coming in around November for Christmas for a lot of families. If the research ends up showing that C8 is a major medical problem, the impact will be on. West Virginia and Ohio residents could be tested over and the next year. And thousands of people are undergoing tests that may ultimately help determine whether all of us are at risk. One of the things that was sort of an unknown at the time was how long this process would take. It ended up taking more than seven years. And the results came back around 2012. Well, virtually the entire affected population, estimated at 70,000 people, participated. 
it's the largest human health study in the history of the world in terms of its breadth and scope. The eyes of the world have been on this science panel. The chemical industry has been keenly interested in what was going to come out of this. They designed the most world-class studies that have ever been done on a pollutant. They spent seven years, seven years studying this community. What other chemical do you have this kind of information about? The science is unequivocal now. And in 2012, they said that there was a link between drinking this in the water and six different diseases. Kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, preeclampsia, and high cholesterol. We found out through a newspaper article. And I was reading, I said, Earl, that C8 can cause, you know, I started naming, them, I said, you have three of those. Mine was cholesterol, and high cholesterol contributes to heart disease. Well, I've got nine stents and I've had a heart attack. After the blood test, I was notified that I had thyroid disease. Was I a guinea pig? What do you think? That's what it looks like. Was Carol Kaplan a guinea pig? Was Cliff Spiker a guinea pig? Was Joy Weaver a guinea pig? Were they thinking we're dumb enough that we don't know what's going on? First, it's the workers you betray by not telling them. And then you betray the community in which these plants operate. And then you betray the community next door, who's also being exposed. We are upstream. We never anticipated that we would be included in any of this. Thousands of people in Vienna, West Virginia, are being told do not drink the water. Clean water distribution sites, they're open until 9 o'clock tonight. They will reopen bright and early tomorrow morning at 8. Have a good day now. It worries me. You know, we've got a lot of cancer in this area, and then you wonder why. This is not just in West Virginia and Ohio. It's being found in drinking water all over the country. PFOAs have been turning up in drinking water in New York State, Vermont. There are some new concerns today over the drinking water in Newcastle, Delaware. The drinking water in portions of the Tennessee Valley. This is something that affects everyone all over the country. You should be more worried about people's lives. <laughs> and in every continent on the planet. PF het bedrijf Dupont produceerde Teflon voor anti aanbaklaag De mens is, de planeet is en dan pas profit. You have to realize the argument that Dupont said is so what? It's in your blood. No. And my position would be you have no right to pollute my blood. I was overwhelmingly disgusted by the findings. The science panel came back and said, we haven't really got a complete link to your deformities. When you look at the deformities that these animals had, that I had the same deformities, <laughs> that's not a coincidence. You could argue that Bucky Bailey's birth defects were not related that the birth defects of the other child in that group of eight children weren't related. And I think DuPont did argue that, that it can't be proven. But the odds of that being the case are, are very low. You study eight women who worked with C8. Two of them had children with birth defects. That would not be significant. 
within the realm of scientific fact, this is not considered a statistically significant sample. They said they didn't have enough information. How much information do you have to have if you got two babies? How much do you need? How can there not be a link? It's hard for me to stay idle and say, OK, I accept this. I don't want to accept it. May it please the court. Ladies and gentlemen, this case breaks down pretty easily. It's not as complicated as you might think. First of all, one of the issues that we're going to be talking about... For years now, it's been argued the chemical is poisonous, but for the first time today, a jury agreed, putting blame on DuPont. A plaintiff in the first case in a long line of personal injury and wrongful death suits against the DuPont company has been awarded $1.6 million. It was definitely a fasten your seatbelts kind of moment. DuPont had realized that juries saw things in a different way than they did. This case is the first case against DuPont that went to court, and it's going to cost them possibly their reputation. I, I think everybody saw the writing on the wall, that if we could win the first case, we could win on virtually all of the cases. A federal jury recently awarded $5.1 million in the second The jury DuPont found scene. that DuPont acted with malice. There's no money in the world they can offer me. It's going to justify. This was a criminal offense. The CEOs of DuPont, they're walking around with their freedom untouched. It's like if I go out here and sprinkle arsenic around, and it gets in people's water, and they slowly get poisoned, and they die, they'd arrest me and charge me for murder. They ought to, they ought to go to jail. Sixteen million dollars? Really? This is a, a company at the time that was selling $25 billion worth of products every year. I'm not sure what the right fine would be for contaminating humanity, contaminating the living world, but I'm pretty sure it's not $16 million. DuPont's big give was to participate in a gradual phase out of C8. By 2015, nobody could make C8. They say that we're not going to stop making Teflon. So should we find something besides C8 to make it with? Gen X is what they're calling it. When there's no safety standard, when there's no required set of tests to bring a chemical to market, you never know if getting rid of one chemical is going to result in bringing in a substitute that's just as bad or worse. Once they started making Gen X, DuPont initiated a rat study. And the results showed the same kind of tumors that we saw with PFOA. forget of sitting in the pre-op and just thinking, you know, what's my reaction going to be when I see him? The first time I saw him, 
They were cleaning them up. They called me over. And I'm thinking to myself, please, Lord, I know this is going to be OK. I know this is going to be OK. But what if it's not OK? <laughs> That cry, I just knew he was, his, his first cries, I knew I was a dad. <laughs> it changed my life, it really did. His eyes are closed, but he's smiling. This is heaven right here for me. This is awesome. This is not something that I should have to have concern about for years and years and years. Yeah. If my son could have a deformity because of some water or some chemical that got in my blood, It's not over yet. This isn't the end. We're going to fight till everyone is safe. <laughs> I don't know what C8 does with lifelong exposure, but changes have to be made. We don't have the science yet to explain long-term exposure, but we're just beginning to understand all kinds of new risks. At very low levels, this Teflon chemistry can affect the immune system. They can have impacts on the nervous system. They can have impacts on how we metabolize various food nutrients, on and on and on. If a person is exposed to C8 on day one, they may not manifest disease for years. Children, for example, we're starting to see them become ill with latent kinds of disease. We don't know how it will affect people for years to come because we're just figuring out what it is. Scientists are, are just catching up with it. And as they're doing this, they've already faced the replacement. So that's already out there. You can see from this story, from this vantage point, that it almost goes on forever. Drinking water in North Carolina is being tested for a toxic substance called Gen X. It turned up recently in the Cape Fear River. Gen X is the replacement chemical being used for Teflon production after DuPont was found to be using a previous toxic chemical. DuPont did stop using C8, but they've just replaced one poison with another. startup with 200 years of experience.